I'm Esther Heckenbach and I'm a PhD student in the geodynamic modeling section at the GFZ in Potsdam. And I'll present you the rate and state friction rheology that I'm trying to implement in aspect. And first of all, I want to say thank you to all of you um, that have helped me on the way with all your pull requests and suggestions would not have been possible without. So my PhD project and why I do this with the rate and state friction is that I want to model the seismic cycle of great earthquakes. And for that, I am um, implementing the rate and state friction equation and aspect. Um, I'm planning to benchmark the implementation against existing codes. And then um, I'll hopefully run some real strike slip models like the San Andreas for maybe to then move on to subduction models like the Andes and 2D and maybe even 3D. My PhD project is not only focused on geodynamic modeling, but um, it aims to also have links with the mathematics side and um, observational data and analog models from other sections at the GFZ Potsdam. So today um, I want to first present you what is the seismic cycle, um, then what is rate and state friction, and then how I implement that in aspect and then also the other requirements for a code that wants to run seismic cycle models. And in the end, I'll show you some preliminary result for a simple strike slip setup that I ran. Um, and also I have a slide with things that I would like to discuss. So if people um, uh, have opinions about that, I would be happy uh, to, to discuss it sometime later today. Um, so the seismic cycle is essentially we have an earthquake happening somewhere and then there's not much happening afterwards and then there's another earthquake and it's already a cycle. And this happens periodically more or less at all, all over the world at faults. And we know quite a bit of it, but we don't know enough yet, um, especially to like foresee when an earthquake might happen and where. So things that we know, for example, are surface movements, which, which we can observe with GPS data or even INSAR. And um, this would be, this is illustrated here for a subduction zone. So here we would have a rupture first and then would have after slip where the upper plate moves seaward. Then there is some, some viscous relaxation of the mantle. And then when the fault relocks, the upper plate is moving landward again, which is something that we can measure. But um, for what is actually happening right before a great earthquakes, there's big discussions in the community and we can't really answer them with the little observational data that we have because these cycles take hundreds of years and we do not have observational data for that not long amount of time. So that's something that we want to bridge with the geodynamic models because there we can actually model hundreds of earthquakes in a row for the same setting and maybe get some statistics out of it. Um, so to model this, um, which is essentially a stick slip behavior for earthquakes, yeah, first a lot of it is happening and then it locks and nothing happens anymore. Um, this is normally done using the rate and state friction law, which is um, an empirical law which can fit laboratory data for um, friction um, for sliding tests, but it's it there's not really a physical explanation for it, but we don't have a better one yet. So what people did to get this law is they had two, two blocks and there was a sliding interface in between and one block was moved against the other and first it was in a slow velocity and the friction angle stayed the same and then when you um, increase the velocity stepwise the um, friction angle or friction coefficient first increases directly with the velocity and then decreases gradually, which is the evolution effect. And when you go back to slow velocities, this happens, but inversely. So um, the, the amount that the friction coefficient increases and then decreases again can be described with the parameters A and B. These you also find here in the actual formulation for the rate and state friction law. Um, and you see that this is quite a compl complex equation and has lots of parameters. So there's A and B, and there's the steady state friction, which would be this line here. And um, steady state friction is, for, is happening at a velocity steady state, which would here be the slow one. So here, that's this V. And um, then it's really important that we have the state variable as well, because it's rate and state friction. And the state variable needs 
um, its own law to describe how it's evolving over the history of the fault. And I implemented the aging law so far. And um, so this means that when I'm right at the earthquake and velocities are really high, then my state at, the, at this um, point is really small. And then when uh, I go away in time, then the state increases again. So this is the components of the rate and state friction law. And then I want to show you how I put that into aspect. Um, so I, I, um, I wrote a new rheology model, which is called friction options. And here I listed the options apart from the one to just use the internal angle of friction as uh, probably most of you do until now. So I put in the dynamic friction, which was in aspect before. It's based on the 2013 paper from Ilona van Dinter. And um, their friction depends on velocity. Then I also put in rate and state friction, where friction don't, doesn't only depend on velocity, but also on state. And I put in two formulations for that, a regularized one and the standard one. And then I also put in dynamic rate and state friction, where also the um, rate and state parameters A and L vary with velocity, but I didn't test it yet. Um, then I put in a state variable. I did this um, a bit like in the elasticity rheology. So um, I have a material field called theta, and I must have this material field to be able to uh, use rate and state friction. Um, then I put in a radiation damping term, um, which, is, which I need because during an earthquake, normally you get so high velocities that part of the energy that you then can measure as seismic waves but we do not have inertia in aspect, so I cannot do this. So I put in the approximation for it, which is the radiation damping turn to get rid of this energy. And last, not, last not least, um, rate and state friction assumes that the material where it occurs is always yielding. So um, I put in um, a hack that normally we compare current stress to yield stress. And if current stress is greater than yield stress, then we yield, the, the material is at yield. But um, I now say that, okay, if I am in this fault material, then I am at yielding always. So it's a bit hard coded. In the rheology model itself, it looks like this. So I mostly put it into the function calculate isostrain viscosities in the viscoplastic rheology. And first, um, I didn't change much. So here's the viscosity, the elasticity, and the strain weakening. And then there come my changes. So I um, calculate the radiation damping term from the current E.2, which is my um, analog to velocity. And then I um, use the radiation damping term to in turn modify the current E.2 again. So I get rid of this excess energy, I would say. And then I have everything I need to calculate I, B and the state variable and then calculate the new friction angle, which is dependent on velocity and state. And then here's the little change in the yield stress condition. But that's not actually everything that you would need to run a rate and state friction model. There's a lot more to it. Because um, during earthquakes, we have we spend a velocity range from first no movement to like tens of meters per second. So we need the time step sizes that range from years to seconds. And this in turn um, has that we have a really big effective viscosity range because of the way elasticity is implemented. Um, then further on, we of course want high resolution for the fault, but don't need it outside for computational demands. That's already good in aspect. So that's um, why this is code's good for it. And we have the viscoelastoplastic rheology by now, which is great. And then I put in radiation damping, but even better would of course be inertia. Um, so most of these things are in aspect now. And um, that's, that was done through these pull requests. And I'm so thankful that these happened over the years. So we have the viscoelastoplastic rheology, um, which is working now. We have the elastic time step, which we discussed hugely during the hackathon. Um, then there's the option about repeating time steps and the minimum time step that we heard about yesterday already. And then um, three weeks ago, I put in the changes from the pull request about dynamic reference viscosity and that ultimately changed my models and I could go, go down to seconds instead of hours. So um, that was pretty exciting. So yeah, this is um, the work that I did during the last year to put all this in. And um, I think now I'm ready to show you what, I actually, what my models actually look like. 
So at the moment, I model simple strike slip models. Um, I have a box, a 3D box. Um, they are periodic in Y direction. I have a fault material on one side. This side is fixed, so it cannot move. And the other side is um, moving with a constant rate. The top and bottom are free slip. And I have these two materials. And I have a finer mesh in the fault material. And now I want to show you what's happening when I actually run this. And I'll start 15 years before my first event. So um, here you see, OK, the whole um, model is blue. And blue is like basically no movement at all. You see, I have a really, really um, far range for velocity. I span nearly eight magnitudes. Um, and now we are going to use them all. So here, my time step size is still five years, which is the maximum that I um, allow. Then going 10 time steps further, um, I am at five minutes before the earthquake. The time step size has decreased quite a bit from five years to 50 minutes. And there's still nothing happening. Then five time steps later, um, my time step size is at one second, which is the minimum I impose. And um, we are now two seconds before the earthquake happens. And here you can already see there is a bit of change in the color scheme. So there is some velocity built up here from the surface. And if we go a second further, you'll see the velocity increases. And then right now, um, the whole fault slips at a velocity of about 5e7 meters per year. And the slip continues for a few seconds um, and then decreases over the next seconds. And um, then at about 20 seconds after the earthquake, the whole model is blue again. So there's not much motion anymore. And it basically looks like before the earthquake. So that's already pretty exciting. But what is even more exciting is that this doesn't only happen once, but it does happen all, all and over, over again. So I do have cycles. And I want to show you the um, time series for these now. So um, here on the on the left hand side, I have the geometry and friction parameters in case you want to have a look at it later. But I want to focus on the right hand side. And here in the red curve, we have velocity over time. And you see that here I don't have much happening. Then I have this peak that we just saw. And then not much happening and another peak. And it continues and continues. So I do get cycles. And when I look at the shear stress, um, the shear stress is also pretty much doing what I would expect. So it builds up during the earthquake, it's released, and it builds up again, and it's released again. And the same for the friction angle. Um, it, it looks pretty much like the graph that I showed you earlier on. So when the velocity increases, the friction angle first goes up and then decreases a huge amount and then goes back to its steady state value. So that's pretty exciting because these models actually work now. Um, what other people do is that they look at the slip distribution over depth. And that's what I want to show you here as well. So here's depth over my model. And here is the cumulative slip since the start of the model. And you see here, I have faces of a lot of slip and then there's not much happening. But what you also see and what worried me a bit is that here I have this peak and I don't really want this peak because I do not vary my parameters over depth. Um, so I would expect that slip is equal all over the depths of the model. But when I change two parameters, especially the critical slip distance and the minimum time step, it's pretty much equal now all over depth. So it has, um, it's, a, it's a lot better now. But it also shows how delicate the system is. So if you change one parameter by just a bit, um, you might get a totally different result. And that's what, where I'm, what I'm working on at the moment. Then um, I want to compare these results that I have now to the benchmark where I want to go and um, actually benchmark my code again, which is from the Lapusta 2000 paper. And here is her slip distribution. I have to say she varies um, parameters over depth. So that's why she has this nice distribution. I have these just straight lines. Um, however, I can compare the amount of slip, which is too large for my models. But I also have um, an interseismic time, which is way too long. So I have about 500 years and she has 100 years. Also, my velocities are not quite there yet. So they're about 0.3 meters per second, while she has more in the range of 10 meters per second. 
Um, so there's still a long way to go, I would say, but I would also say that during the last year, I, I have reached quite something now, so that we are actually able to model seismic cycles and aspect. Um, that brings me to my last slide with the things that I would like to discuss. Um, and I would be really happy if some of you have an opinion to some of this. So um, for earthquake cycle models, it would be great to have inertia. And I would I wonder how this can be done, if this is possible, and if yes, how can we tackle this? Um, I need to rethink how to determine a time step size. Um, then how to improve convergence, because right now when my velocities go up, the convergence is really not that great. Then I would like to make it more flexible and not hard code that always yielding is assumed for the material called fault. And I need some way to represent slip, for example. So if you have any comments, suggestions, uh, questions or whatever about the rate and state friction rheology, um, it would be great if you just contact me. And also about the other parameters and pull requests that I tested, especially the elastic time step, if you struggle with that, um, I can give you some material about that. It might save you some time. Yeah, so um, thanks for listening and that was it. Awesome, thank you, Esther. Um, so we are about on time. So we are, we are five minutes behind our schedule because the keynote went a bit over time. Um, I would uh, appreciate it if we can maybe keep the questions for the discussion um, session later. Um, Esther, will you still be there for that? Yeah. Okay, perfect. So maybe we can keep questions until then um, mm -hmm. to stay more or less on schedule and don't get too much into the break.